Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is Sarah Dara Littman, an award-winning columnist for the Connecticut News Junkie. And she's also an author of four books for teens. Her first novel, Confessions of a Closet Catholic, won the 2006 Sidney Taylor Book Award. Sarah recently wrote a column called A Woman Voter's Guide to the 2012 Election, where she calls herself a recovered Republican because of the party's unholy marriage with a socially conservative right wing. She followed with tough words for both Governor Romney and U.S. Senate candidate Linda McMahon. We've invited her back to talk about the election. Sarah, welcome back to Stream of Conscience. Thanks for having me back. So, Sarah, you start the column talking about the uh, Republican Party's uh, platform on abortion and the fact that it contained no exceptions whatsoever for anything at all. Abortions under the Republican Party plan would simply be outlawed. Um, and that, I think, made you angry. It makes me very angry, particularly because um, as a Jew, um, Part of my uh, religion is that the um, the health of the mother is paramount, mm -hmm. um, and I feel that the Republican Party platform is now um, so Christian um, and so not. It says it's pro-life, but really it's pro-fetus. Um, it's not pro-existing life. Um, one of the things that I think is, is so human about Judaism is that it re actually um, recognizes that the mother is so important to the life of the family. Mm -hmm. And that, um, yes, while you know, the, the pregnancy is, is vital, the, life, the mother is alive already. Mm -hmm. And the mother is responsible to the children she may have alive already. And so to put the mother's life at, you know, at risk to save um, a fetus um, who may or may not be viable um, when she already has children, when she already has a family, to me is not pro-life. It's insane. Mm. And now that this is actually a plank in the Republican Party platform, tells me how extreme this party has become. And I think that was brought home by the selection of Paul Ryan as the, re the Republican Party vice presidential candidate because he'd actually sponsored legislation in the House along with Todd Akin, uh, the, our famous Republican running yes. for, for U.S. Senate from Missouri, uh, that would have put these things into practice. Yes, and, and which, which um, tried to redefine rape as forcible rape as if they're, you know... What it's, other kind yeah. of rape is there? Yes, I, and... Um, and that the whole idea that we have to define rape as you know as being forcible, um, I find so incredibly offensive and misogynistic um, mm -hmm. that it, it just enrages me. And and my my children look at me, which I think I, I wrote in the um, in the column. Um, my teenage children look at me and and say, Mom, how could you ever have been a Republican? Hmm. And, um, you know, I have to explain to them, like, the, the Republican Party then was not the Republican Party that it is now. Um, and they find it hard to believe. But if you talk to, the, you know, some New England Republicans, they will agree. Right. Well, and, I think, think about know. some of the other Republicans, like John Kasich in Ohio, who thinks that women should be doing laundry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, believe me, that column could have been a lot longer, <laughs> you know? I mean, if I really wanted, originally I wanted to detail all the things that made me so crazy during this election season, and I could have gone on for pages and pages and pages, um, but I had to limit it. Um, mm -hmm. And it was hard, believe me, because there is just so much material. Um, well, you, you quoted in the column uh, one of the Romney spokespeople talking about uh, you're going to see Democrats use all sorts of shiny objects to distract people's attention from Obama and the performance on the economy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, are you uh, attracted to shiny objects? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, again, it's sort of the patronizing um, idea that, that we are um, too, um, you know, too uh, 
you know, stupid or um, easily you know, distracted, easily distracted right. um, to um, to actually care about the important things. Right. Um, but 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 actually, um, in a way, he's right because I think this election is about the low information voter, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of scary. But um, it it has been ab about how do you, how do you mean that? because I think. Um, I think that there are so many people who, um, who don't really understand, you know, who haven't been paying attention. I think they're beginning to pay attention, mm -hmm. but they haven't been paying attention until recently. Well, we only have a few weeks left. Yeah. Um, Thank God for that. Yeah, I know, because it's been a really, <laughs> it's been a long, hard... <laughs> for those of us who are political junkies, yeah, I think it's we're been, pretty tired of We're exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> I know I am. I yeah. know. Um, but... Um, and I know my kids are, but they're so sick of hearing me talk <laughs> about everything. But um, but it um, but I think for the general population, you know, the general population who are watching Honey Boo Boo, and here comes Honey Boo Boo. I, I'll I'll call this the Honey Boo Boo voter election. <laughs> you know, we had the soccer moms, we had the you know the NASCAR voter. You know, this is the the Honey Boo Boo election. You know, oh my God, um, heaven help us. But um, but the people who've been sort of focused on their reality shows and and not really paying attention, yeah. um, are suddenly tuning in. And when they actually start to think about what is what this is about, um, and then you know the the Romney video that came out with the the sort of damning forty seven percent, and people wake up and think, well, wait a minute, you know, m veterans, I mean, you know, military people on military bases who are serving their country are getting government benefits. Well, you let, know, let's stay with abortion for just a minute yeah. because if Romney is elected it's almost certain that in the next four years there'll be at least one, perhaps two, of the justices on the Supreme Court who will be either stepping down or otherwise depart from the court. Yeah, we have four, four Supreme Court justices who are in their 70s. Right, and, um, and one of yeah. them, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is not in good health, uh, and she's been a reliable pro uh, uh, Roe v. Wade vote. And, and he said on Meet the Press that he would um, you know, he would uh, uh, appoint someone who would be likely to overturn Roe v. Right. Wade. It's um, a litmus test for him. Yeah. And his, in his view, Roe v. Wade was wrong. And right now, there's a, there's been a five to four majority for Roe on the court. But if, if, uh, if we lose any one of the four liberal justices, then that'll go away. Yeah. And if we lost two of them, in this term. The way they're appointing justices younger and younger, they could be there for thirty years. Yeah, and it, and that to me is is terrifying. Um, yeah. That you know that my daughter could grow up in a country th where um, where there's where abortion is illegal again. Mm. So let's talk about the forty-seven percent because to me that video um, encapsulated the argument that the Obama people were making during the summer, which is that Romney is basically out of touch. And here it seemed, although he says he's taken out of context, I don't see how, um, you know, that he is not simply out of touch, but that he has basically dismissed half the people in the country. And he does it, it seemed at the same time that he was conflating two or three different ideas into one. One is that there are 47% of the people in the country who don't pay any kind of uh, you know, federal income tax, although of course they pay other taxes. Um, and at the same time that there are about that many people in the country who receive some sort of benefits from the government in return. Um, and he's putting those two together and thinking that they're the same people and that therefore they're government dependent and that they like to be seen as victims. Yeah, and uh, that they're whiny and they're, well, you know, yes. they're, they're, you know, yeah, the victims. Yeah. Um, and, um, and interestingly, Linda McMahon, in her um, her speech when she declared as a candidate, also used that forty-seven percent figure. Right. Although she then, um, when when the Romney tape came out, she um, you know was like, "Oh, this is so terrible that you know." Which is so. Let's talk about the forty-seven percent yeah. because there are forty-seven percent of the country that doesn't pay federal income taxes. And but part of it is because they're not making enough money to pay federal income tax. Right. They're the working poor. Yes. And um, 
And part of the reason we have the working poor is because we've had such a huge wealth divide growing in our country um, since the Reagan years. Um, yeah, so let, and part of that's because of tax policy. Right, and the uh -huh. tax policy that really is at the root of this is... The, uh, the Bush, Bush tax cut, yeah, starting with the Bush tax cut, well, starting with the Reagan tax cuts and then Actually, perpetuated by the Bush tax cuts. There yeah. is a provision in the code that returns money to the working poor rather than ask them to, to pay money. Yeah. And that actually started in the Ford administration. And again, it was a conservative Republican economist, Milton Friedman, yeah. who came up with what they called uh, you know, the, the credits, federal credits, right. tax credits. Yeah. Yeah. And tax credits, in fact, pay people money rather than asking them to pay federal income taxes, but it only goes to people who are working. And Milton oh, Friedman... Oh, yeah, no, I thought you were talking about the wealth divide. Right, right, no, right, but right the, yeah. yeah. But, but the, the 47% part, the, yeah, yeah. Right, but, the, but yeah. amongst those 47% are people who are actually getting paid by the government as assistance while they work. Yeah. And the idea Milton Friedman thought was, let us promote the idea of working. Yeah. And if somebody is not making enough money to, to be above the poverty line, then we will actually supplement their money from the federal government. And that started in a Milton Freeman. It was in Gerald Ford. It was expanded by Ronald Reagan, who called it the greatest thing that he'd done in the tax code. Yeah. It was expanded again in the Bush tax cuts, in fact. Yeah. They, they expanded this federal tax credit. So they have created... You Republican, can't get a whole lot more conservative than Milton Freeman. You cannot. <laughs> Republican presidents have actually promoted, expanded the idea of people receiving money from the government through the tax system while they're working. And so they're part of the 47%. Yeah. Who else is in the 47%? I think there are lots of, I, I think yeah, yeah, retirees. Retirees, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, retirees, um, people, uh, some of them are, um, you know, people in military, ser you know, serving on military, yep. serving overseas in the military. That's right. um, you know. Uh, don't ask them to pay federal income taxes when they're. They're putting themselves in harm themselves. Rate, no, harm's way. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, um, so, and, uh, and those are people who are more likely to be supporting Romney to begin with. So yeah. they, I don't see them as victims. Yeah. And I don't see them as, uh, they are dependent on the government, but not in the same way that he's talking about. He, he thinks it is because of entitlements. Yeah. And it's, in that case, it's because of their service. Yeah, but that's, I mean, and that's what um, I get so angry about is that these figures are thrown around in this sort of right-wing talking machine mm. um, and then latched onto with, by, you know, and, and repeated with so little understanding mm -hmm. of what they actually mean. Right. And I then, mean, and then the sort of honey boo boo voter will say, "Oh, but the, you know, but the the forty seven percent of people don't pay taxes." Right. Not really understanding and, and what just, they mean. And, and what you just said there, don't pay taxes, and yet, yeah, it's really federal income taxes. So if they're working, they're paying payroll tax. Yeah. If they drive a car, they're paying gasoline tax. If they're buying things in the store, they're paying sales tax. If they live in a house, whether they own it or not, they're either directly or indirectly paying property taxes. Uh, it, the list goes on and on. We yeah. have taxes all throughout our system, and yet the, the mantra has become 47% don't pay taxes. Yeah. It's just And crazy. we're supporting those, those right. moochers. Yeah. Moochers, <laughs> right. Yeah. Which, so. I mean, uh, you know, I, as I think I wrote in a previous column, I, I was a big Ayn Rand fan when I was in were high school. Really? I was. I, I have my, I still so have. So you really are a recovered I something. really am. <laughs> <laughs> I can raise my hand. I still have my dog-eared copy of the Atlas Shrugged yeah. on my bookshelf. Yeah. Um, I, I read it several times. So did you I, really? I, yeah, I did. I was, I So am, what turned the corner for you? Um, I think... Um, growing up and real, I think sometimes, you know, Just growing up? Well, <laughs> well, no, I think um, realizing that life is not black and white. Mm -hmm. You know, t as a teenager, you, you uh, I have two of them in my house now. Well, one's <laughs> in college now, but teenagers are very black and white. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're a teenager, you're, you feel things very passionately mm -hmm. and you, um, you know, I write for teenagers now, so I still have that mindset. You know, I can still put myself into that mindset, mm -hmm. but you view the world in a very black and white way. Yeah. And unfortunately, that is how a lot of our politics are right now. Right. Um, but as you grow up and mature, hopefully, you realize that the world is not black and white. People mm -hmm. are complex, situations are complex, 
and the world is not black and white. And people are not just, you know, uh, are, are not just John Galt and moochers. <laughs> you know, the world is the a lot. The makers and the takers. The makers and the takers. You right. know, that, 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 that the world is a lot more complex that, than that. Mm. And, um, and, you know, I, I, when I worked on Wall Street, I saw people who were wonderful people and I saw people who were total slime bags. Mm. And, um, you know, and it, it influenced me a great deal. Yeah. So speaking of Wall Street, um, in this column you also talk about the stock market. And, um, you know, everybody, again, the Republican talking point is that the economy is in the tank, that Obama has done a terrible job, that we've had no recovery whatsoever, that the stimulus didn't work, and that uh, Romney is a job creator, and so therefore vote for Romney. Um, you point out in the column that uh, the stock market doesn't seem to reflect that view. No, it certainly doesn't. Um, and I'd be very interested to you know, uh, see how Romney's own portfolio is done <laughs> under Obama. It's but all of course, the he, Cayman Islands. Yeah, you know. that's right. Um, <laughs> we'll never see it. Yeah, um, but um, you know, the, the stock market certainly has, has you know, recovered very nicely from, uh, in fact, when it didn't do well, was um, last summer when the Republican was the Republican uh, the Tea Party freshmen were about to send us over the financial cliff. That's right. Um, and, uh, and you can see the dip in the stock market at that time. And yeah, then, because and then they came to some kind of agreement, and the stock market started going back up. Exactly. Again. Right. Um, and uh, you know, so um, what the market doesn't like is the uncertainty right. of thinking that we might default for the first time in our you know. Right in our uh, history. country's history yeah. on our sovereign financial debt. Yeah. That's what they don't like. Yeah. And that's what they're gonna be looking for, yes. is to see that we can actually act like sane human beings mm -hmm. and find compromises. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the, other, the other point that I would make is that um, Romney, I, I believe it was in the Meet the Press interview, um, actually made a wonderful case for Obama. Okay. Because he, um, he said that, um, or I think it was going to be the press, he said, um, I think he was asked if he would be able to balance the budget in his first term. Right. And he was like, well, no, I, I would not be able to do that because the impact on the economy would be too, too, too devastating. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, so all you guys are, you know, uh, and all you Tea Partiers are criticizing Obama for the, the deficit. And, and, and he's saying this now after we're turning the corner mm -hmm. um, of this, you know, huge, devastating, um, you know, possible depression that we might have entered when we were in meltdown, right. when, when Obama came into power. And, and Romney still thinks that he couldn't balance the budget coming from the point we are now. Right. But they're criticizing Obama for not doing it in four years um, from where we were four years ago. And I'm like, okay, and, and Romney's saying he might not even need to be able to do it in two terms. Like right. he's like, oh, well, you know, it would definitely be maybe by the end of my second terms it might take 12 years. You know, because the, the impact on the economy would be too harsh. Right. And I'm like, you have just made the best case for reelecting Obama. And meanwhile, but then, meanwhile, he, uh, he, he chose Ryan, the guy who wants to cut everything, <laughs> and you know, except signed- Except defense. Except defense, um, you know, and who signed the Jim DeMint pledge, and you know, who's like, you know, wants to cut Medicare, you know. Re remind us of the Jim DeMint pledge. The Jim DeMint pledge is you cannot, I, I can't remember the exact words, but it's like you can't, um, Basically, it's no. You can't raise any taxes, mm -hmm. and um, you have to. Uh, That's Grover Norquist as well. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The Norquist pledge. Yeah, like you have to have so much. I think it's is it, is it three to one? I can't remember, but like you have to cut so much spending for any. Yeah, it, I mean, it's like it basically boxes you into a corner where it's impossible to balance the budget unless you have huge, huge cuts in spending. So. Let's assume for a moment that, uh, that Romney is not elected um, and we reach this fiscal cliff that we're headed toward in December when the Bush tax cuts all expire all at once and in addition the payroll tax that was the payroll tax reductions that we've been facing for the last two years 
go away again, as well as all of these spending cuts that were negotiated last year when they basically kicked the can down the road in the deficit reduction package because they couldn't agree on anything. So they said, okay, we're going to cut $500 billion here and $500 billion there, defense, everything else, all on the table. And people have looked at this and said, well, if all of this happens, it'll be a huge kick in the head to the economy. Uh, and the economy will, in fact, contract instead of grow. What do we do? I can only hope that we elect enough sane people mm -hmm. in this election that we get to the, you know, that we're able to negotiate a solution. That's, otherwise, I don't even know what we do. So here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I have to say that I am not entirely confident that that's going to happen. Right. But um, that's my biggest fear, is that we get to that point and we still have a house full of crazy well, people who, d who don't understand macroeconomics. I mean, that was the thing to me, yeah. that when the, the, you know, last summer when we were about to, like, you know, default on our sovereign debt, mm -hmm. that they actually had to get economists into Congress to explain to these freshman con Tea Party congressmen basic macroeconomics. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of them rely on what I refer to as faith-based economics. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Romney, in that video that we saw, he said along the lines, he said, look, you know, if I get elected without even doing anything, th the situation is going to get better. Well, why is that? Well, because he thinks that he um, embodies some kind of positive atmosphere for the, for the economy and that everybody will say, oh, well, you know, Romney's in now. It's going to be better and therefore that'll make it better. That's faith-based economics. Um, yeah, the people who are in the Congress today, unfortunately, are still going to be there after the election, but before we get to the cliff. Because yeah. the cliff happens on the 1st of January, yeah. and they're still in office on the 1st of yeah. January. They don't get turned out until like the first week of January. Right. So yeah. sometime in between the election, 6th of November, and the end of December, Somebody's got to reach a deal, and um, my concern is that even if a lot of these guys lose their reelection bids and are headed out the door, they're not going to want. Try and, they're, they're, yeah. they're not going to want a deal. Yeah. So I, I, I'm afraid that we're going to look at a situation where we actually do go off the cliff, and it'll have to be the next Congress that pulls us back. Um, yeah. It'll kind of be like a, I don't know, Roadrunner, Wiley, Coyote thing, you know, where you... You're making me want to go home and call my broker <laughs> and take all my money out of the market again. <laughs> I was just getting to the point where I was starting to invest, yeah. and then, like, now I'm like, I'm going to be like, sell everything. <laughs> no, seriously, last summer, it was actually after I had a, 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 a conversation with Justin Bernier, mm. and, uh, and he was like, you know, he was like, he would sign the Jim DeMint pledge and blah, blah. And I'm thinking, if a New England Republican is, is going to sign the Jim DeMint pledge, then if a New England Republican is that crazy, yeah. I'm taking my money out of the stock market. And I did. And you did. And I was very happy about it. <laughs> so I actually kind of had to think of So you did some market timing and it worked. I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I missed a little bit of the run up recently, uh -huh. you know, but like uh, now I'm kind of like, OK, I'm, you know, I'm feeling a little better about life, whatever. I'll start, you know, and, and now I'm kind of like, uh oh, <laughs> now I'm thinking maybe I shouldn't. Have. <laughs> well, we're, we're all going to have to watch this very closely because yeah. it's the ride. It's, it, it's, the, it's really frightening. It yeah. is frightening. It's been crazy and it's been at times terrifying. And yeah. I see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, I th uh, but you know, November sixth can't come fast enough. For it me. really can't. Yeah. It cannot. It's just stomach, stomach churning. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming in. That was my pleasure. And, uh, <laughs> Anytime. We'll keep reading you in Connecticut <laughs> News Junkie and look for your next teenage novel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. You can find all our shows on YouTube by going to YouTube slash user slash. DFA TV Net. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Or you can send comments or suggestions for a show to info at dfa-tv.net. If you'd like to learn more about progressive political action, we meet at 7 p.m. on the first Wednesday of the month 
at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk. We'd love to have you join us. Remember, change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. Thanks for watching. <laughs>